En estos cambios, en estos procesos de los que estamos hablando acá, pues eh, lógicamente hay logros y hay desafíos. De eso vamos a hablar en el segundo momento en la conferencia. Thank you very much. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here in Santo Domingo and to have an opportunity to speak to a really distinguished and important uh, audience in this country. So it's um, my, my pleasure. Uh, I would like to maybe move this session a little bit in a North American direction. I will be very careful to speak for the amount of time I'm allocated, and I would like also to have maybe a chance not only to hear some questions from you, but also to hear brief comments. How are you reacting to what Antonio and I are saying? Our discussions, Antonio first and me second, are nicely related on a similar topic. Um, uh, I, I want first to bring you a little bit of good news. He said that there's going to be a revolution in universities and that we will not recognize them in some years' time. I'm maybe more, you can say, either optimistic or pessimistic. I think we're changing a little bit more slowly than he says. Universities are famous for being conservative institutions. He points out, and I will discuss, that we are indeed in a revolution in higher education, unprecedented really since the invention, development of the Western university idea in the Middle Ages in the, in the, in the Western uh, countries. So we are in a period of profound change. And I think it's very important to keep in mind that this change affects, on the one hand, all countries, and on the other hand, it affects us in different ways. In other words, a country like the Dominican Republic will have to think its own way to the new revolution in higher education that will be different in many respects from other places in the world. I think that you can especially learn from your neighbors. Recently I was in Panama and many of the things that they were discussing are rather similar to the things that I hear from colleagues in this country. Further, I think that this meeting here, this workshop, is very, very central to the future of higher education in the Dominican Republic and maybe in the region. And I hope very much that these discussions will continue, that this is the first of good thinking, independent thinking about the future of higher education here and trying to understand both in a theoretical way but more important in a practical way about what are the issues that are affecting you because it's your future and as Antonio said and we, as we all know with the changes in the global knowledge economy that I will be discussing in a moment, the future is both profound and not so clear. And it's, what is clear is that universities and post-secondary education in general will play absolutely a key role in that change. So what we are doing all of us in this room, is central to the future of the nation, of the region, and of the world. So 
we need to take it seriously. As I said, as Antonio said, we are in the midst of a profound change. And I'm going to discuss the two key elements, both of which he mentioned, but I will go into more detail. One of them is the impact of massification, the growth of mass higher education, and the contradiction to that mass revolution, which is the impact of the global knowledge economy. Because one affects the bottom of the system, and one affects the top of the system, and so often we don't realize that there are very significant differences and needs of the different kinds of institutions that are part of this system. In fact, we don't think of higher education in most countries as a system, and we need to do so. We need to figure out how the different kinds of post-secondary institutions can work together and can serve the broader society. Not everybody needs a university degree. Most people need some kind of post-secondary preparation. One of the many problems in the Dominican Republic, I consider myself an expert on the Dominican Republic because I have the philosophy that if you are in a country for one day, you're an expert. And if you're in a country for three days, you know nothing. <laughs> because life is complicated. But I am in the state of no complication, because I just arrived. And talking to people, I've learned a little bit. So I'm an expert. So I'm going to say a few things about the Dominican Republic, which are probably completely wrong, but you can think about it. In the Dominican Republic, for example, almost all of your 500,000 students are in universities. Not a good idea. Many of them should be in other kinds of post-secondary institutions, providing, as Antonio said, a more practical education. The Dominican Republic is not alone. Many countries, especially developing countries, have a premium on getting a university degree because that's prestigious. But it doesn't work in the long run. One of the impacts of the mass revolution is the differentiation and diversity of post-secondary education. And that needs to be understood by governments and also by the market, by the students, uh, in, uh, in all countries, uh, including uh, th uh, this one. And we need to respect non-university post-secondary education and make sure that that kind of education leads to good jobs in the labor force. So we need to think of post-secondary education as a system. We've done that in the United States pretty well. It's not the only way to do it, but the American thinking about systems pioneered, as, as our Rector Julio said before, pioneered actually by Clark Kerr, uh, who actually invented this system back in the 1960s in California, and we, we know it now as the California system of community colleges, and by the way, about one-third of American students attend community colleges, uh, not universities, Above that, the, uh, the mass uh, access universities the, in California, the California State University system, and at the top, the research-oriented University of California system. And they fit together. 
And what's very important about the system in California and most other U.S. states is that there is mobility among the institutions in the system. So a student can transfer up if he or she wants to and is qualified. So we have to think of universities as a system in the mass age. If I had been giving this talk a year ago, I would not be talking about a deep and I think quite central political crisis, social crisis, that is going on in many countries uh, around the world. For me, the key part of that is, of course, the rise of Mr. Trump as president and all that he represents and what he represents is unfortunately quite important for the United States society and for the rest of the world because for better or for worse, and I think for worse, generally speaking, what happens in the United States affects other countries, not only when Mr. Trump is in power, but otherwise as well. So we have seen the rise of nationalism and populism in America. They are now in control of the government, although the recent election uh, earlier this month will make a modest change with the House of Representatives now being in the hands of the Democrats. Uh, so uh, our checks and balances are beginning to work a little bit, uh, but it's a deep crisis. And of course, there are reasons for it. These things don't just happen. And you can see in Europe similar developments. And I'd be interested in Antonio's reflections, maybe, uh, on, uh, on that, uh, how it's changing things there. I wonder, in the era of Brexit, if the, broadly speaking, the European idea, which I think is quite central to the global knowledge economy and to the world, can survive with the rise of nationalism and populism in countries like first in Hungary, where it's most serious, I think, but also now in Italy, and of course in Poland, and to some extent in Czech Republic. And this contagion is part of what's going on in many parts of the world. We can see in China a closing of the political and intellectual space to some extent, and with deep concern among Chinese, some Chinese academics and intellectuals, what is the future of their country and their universities in a context where academic freedom, which was never very strong, is constricted? We can see in Russia, uh, I happen to work in Russia these days on a committee there, that my colleagues are also noting a closing, a, um, well, a tightening of the political constraints on writing and on research uh, and more broadly on politics. So these are deeply worrying issues which affect higher education. And I think for you in the Dominican Republic, you need to function in this world and hopefully you will not go in this direction. I wish you good luck in that respect. But you're, we are all in that world and all of us will be affected. Internationalization will be affected. What will the Americans do about permitting students from other countries to come in? We just had statistics yesterday about the flow of international students into the US. And for the first time, for the second time, 
The first time was last year, the second time is this year. The numbers are down. And the numbers are dramatically down in the non-elite university sector in the US. So the unwelcoming nature of our political system at the present time, visa restrictions, and other issues of that sort are affecting how students and academics think about the US as a place to go. And my view is this will, once it starts, it will continue. Maybe not permanently, probably not permanently, but it will be part of our reality for a while. And this is going to damage the American scientific quality and impact uh, around the world. So maybe the Dominican Republic with, uh, this is a joke, um, with brilliant policies can attract some of the best minds that otherwise would have gone to the United States. Probably that's too much to think, but you have, a you, you have opportunities and difficulties in this new world. If the European Union gets less important, if some of the additional countries become more nationalist and populist, what will this mean in terms of opportunities for your students and faculty going to those places? On the other hand, if the EU maintains its openness, um, you can benefit from that as the British and the Americans close. So we're in the midst of significant political changes. Let me discuss for a few minutes what I think are the impacts of massification and the global knowledge economy. The nature of this, these phenomena, has been already pointed out this morning, but what does it actually mean? First of all, it can't be stopped. It's a permanent part of the, polit the, the social, political, educational environment uh, all around the world. And it will continue. Antonio pointed out we have more than 200 million students studying globally at the moment, and we will probably double that number by the year 2040. And in the next 20 years, the major growth in numbers will be in just two countries, and you can guess what they are, China and India, because they are still in the massification process. China enrolls about 27% of its age group in higher education, well below yours, by the way, um, uh, and India enrolls about 12%. So these are countries with a billion population each, so there's going to be a lot of growth. There will be growth here, too, because you're at, what, 54% access at the moment? And most middle-income and above countries in Latin America and in the rest of the world are at 35, 40, 50% uh, uh, access to post-secondary education. So you have a ways to go, and you will go that way. I can predict with complete assurance that no matter what the government says, there will be expansion of enrollments here. And how you deal with that, of course, in terms of the quality which has been discussed already this morning, uh, uh, in terms of other aspects uh, uh, is, is key because you will have to deal with that set of, uh, uh, of issues. So massification is here to stay. And what does it mean, essentially? It means diversification of higher education institutions and the emergence in, in many countries of systems, I discussed that, and a realization that all universities are not the same, that they serve different populations, 
that they serve different purposes, and that nations and, uh, and governments need to understand and plan for that differentiation and diversity. Massification has meant tremendous diversity in students and the challenge of providing effective education for all of them has really not been met almost everywhere. The secret of American higher education is that we do quite a good job of access. We do a rather bad job of completion. In other words, our dropout rate is, depending on how you measure it, is a third or a little more of the students. And only about 25% finish a four-year academic degree in four years. Most take longer. This is not good. It's not good for the students. It costs extra money for them and for the, for, and for the state uh, and, and so on. So massification has meant a diversity in the kinds of students, social class, gender, in many countries ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds and so on. And it's been difficult for post-secondary institutions and governments to recognize that and to deal with the students. I don't know what the dropout rate is in the Dominican Republic. My guess is it's pretty high. Um, and that's part of massification. Overall, higher education has declined in quality as a result of massification. And when you think about it for one minute, it's pretty obvious. As countries are educating, maybe I should put in quotation marks, educating, uh, large numbers of students, it's been very difficult to make sure that they are provided with a quality, however you measure quality, with a quality education because often the academic backgrounds of the students, because they come from lower socioeconomic classes, they've had, they have less what we call cultural capital. They've received not such a great primary and especially secondary education. And I know that the entire purpose of the distinguished institution which is sponsoring this conference is aimed at, include, at improving the quality of teachers in this country to provide better quality, not only for the schools, but also for the students who are going to inevitably enter the higher education system. And I think that that responsibility is of tremendous importance, and of course, very complicated as well. So we've seen on average around the world probably a deterioration in the overall quality. That doesn't mean that Harvard or Oxford or the Sorbonne has gotten worse. Indeed, they've gotten better. But it does mean that the average is not as good as it once was when we had an elite post-secondary university system where all the young people who entered that system, who were in Europe a half a century ago, only five or seven percent in most countries of the age group. So you were educating kids who had a good secondary education. And that's not the case uh, anymore uh, in, in significant parts of the system. We've seen very importantly, and of tremendous importance in this country, the rise of the private sector in higher education. Private universities are the fastest growing part of post-secondary education in the world. And we've seen a dramatic shift, especially in Latin America, 
toward the private sector in the last half century. Much of Latin America, with the exception of Cuba, and maybe that's the only exception, has a majority of students in private higher education today. In the Dominican Republic, it's 60% or something. And I suspect, well, I don't know whether it's going up, but it's, it's a majority. And that private sector is of mixed quality, mixed ownership, and mixed clarity about its mission and role in the society. I like to use the term the private sector in the public interest because I think that's what's most important. And very few countries have been able to deal with that challenge because the private sector has grown so rapidly and because there are so many interests at play with the private higher education sector. But it is, for whatever reasons, for many reasons, a key part of the, uh, the post-secondary system in many, uh, in, 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 in many countries. And I think in the Dominican Republic, a great challenge is to try to deal with that system. We, we in my center in Boston, curiously enough, are currently doing some research on what we call family-owned universities. I think there are probably a few in Dominican Republic. Uh, there are many in other parts of the world. Our guess is more than 400. And in some countries, like the Philippines, the family-owned model is the dominant one. And some of those places are on the Manila Stock Exchange. If you want to buy stock in a university, you can do that. Um, and how do families run universities? It's an interesting topic, um, not central. I just mention it as, a, as an example of what we might do. So these are some of the implications of massification. And they are, they are central to the present and future of post-secondary education. And a country like the Dominican Republic needs to think big about how to deal with it because it's central to your reality, it's central to all of our reality. The other element that I'd like to discuss for a few minutes is the global knowledge economy, which is the opposite of massification. And that also affects this country, all countries. I'm asked sometimes, because I co-authored a book on world-class universities, um, w one comment I once made, which is widely quoted, is everyone wants a world-class university, but no one knows what it is. <laughs> and that's probably still true although I made the comment 10 years ago. Um, the global knowledge economy affects us all in the sense that our national economies are increasingly effect affected, despite Mr. Trump and despite other people, by global trends and by science and technology, which were discussed in the previous session, which flow across borders all the time and absolutely. Sometimes there are problems, like when the Chinese steal lots of intellectual property. But it is part of reality and it's quite central. And higher education systems need to be a central part of that global knowledge economy. That does not mean that all universities or post-secondary education institutions need to be world-class or need to be focused on participating. We talk in the United States about flagship universities. Each of our state systems has, in most cases, one 
major research university as part of that system. In California, they have seven uh, in the UC system. Um, it's a very big state. Um, so I think that every country, big or small, needs to have at least one university. And in the case of smaller countries, perhaps like this one, although my expertise of one day does not extend to this, um, needs to have probably just one. But the point is, in this country, I thought the same thing in Panama, that the nation needs to think which of these institutions is going to be the flagship, is going to be the institution which relates in terms of its research, its outreach, its internationalization to the top universities around the world. One cannot expect, let's take Panama so I'm not insulting the Dominican Republic. In Pan one cannot expect that Panamanian scholars in the best university in the country are going to be winning Nobel Prizes anytime soon. But that university, which by the way in Panama doesn't exist, that flagship university needs to be able to communicate on an equal basis with the best and the brightest all around the world. And the same is true here. So you need to take into account the global knowledge economy because it's all around you. Um, and you need to have, and it's the government really that needs to make the difficult decisions. You need to have planning and financing available to ensure that that university exists. What is required of a real research university? And please remember, in the United States, we have about 3,200 post-secondary institutions. Of that number, maybe 200 are real research universities. They're the 61 members of the Association of American Universities, the club of the research institutions. And another, we argue about it, another 100 maybe, maybe a little more, who are not AAU members, but are, are really research focused. My own institution, which isn't an AAU member because we don't have medicine and we don't have engineering, um, but we are a research university and ranked highly among uh, 32, actually, among the American research universities. But my point here is that it's only a small part of even the American system that is research focused. Those universities need to have most of their faculty being full time. And that will be, in the Dominican Republic, a complete revolution. Those universities need to have their faculty with PhD degrees. That too will be a revolution in the Dominican Republic. Those universities will be largely public institutions. There are only a few countries that have private research universities. The United States is the most famous one, and people think because the American research university, great research universities are about half private ones, um, that the rest of the world is like that. It's not true. In fact, only Japan, along with the US, has significant numbers of private research universities of a world-class standard. There are a few others scattered around. The uh, Pontifical University in Chile, Catholic University in Chile, is by the rankings a, a world-class research uh, university. So there are a few, but there are not many. 
So they are mainly public institutions for good and bad, but that's the, that, that's the reality. Um, they are institutions which are going, to, are going to have to deal with global English. Now, I am standing here as I think the only person in this room who does not speak Spanish. Uh, and I look around the audience and I'm very happy to report very few of you are sleeping <laughs> and relatively few of you are using headsets. So there is growing knowledge of English and a big question for many countries is how do you use English? Yes, the top institutions in a country need to have very good English facility. Do they need to offer courses in English? Maybe. Do, they, do other universities need to offer courses in English? Maybe not. This country and the rest of the Spanish-speaking world is in a funny situation because Spanish is an international language of quite significant importance, and yet all of us are living in the, in the universe of global English. So if you were in Bosnia, or maybe even in Portugal, clearly English is important in your future. It's a little less clear here and in Latin America in general, but my argument is some, some knowledge of English and some dealing with the world of global English is of great uh, great importance. Research universities mean internationalized universities with the ability to attract at least some international students so that you get that mix and some international faculty. I know from my experience in Russia that they focus a lot on both of those things and in the current political situation between Russia and most of the rest of the world, it's increasingly difficult for them to attract international uh, uh, faculty. Uh, but they have that as a goal, and they spend a lot of money trying to do that with some success. So global research universities need to be internationalized universities. They need to provide an international experience to their students on campus, what we call internationalization at home. Uh, but they also need to provide mobility, inward and outward, for faculty and for students. Let me conclude by just giving you a small list of what I think are some of the challenges if you want, you can ask some questions or make some comments about them. I have not enough time to discuss them in any detail, some of which I talked about. There is a challenge, uh, and this goes now for both massification and the global knowledge economy. There is a challenge of equity and access. How do we re provide real equity and access to the, to the young people who want it? And how do we make sure that they are able to do the work of higher education? And that's where an institution like this one here, our sponsor, plays a very important role. The challenge of research. How do we fund especially basic research in this context? More and more countries are focusing on applied research, on university industry collaboration, and all that, great. But it's basic research that leads to advances in science and to Nobel Prizes in the, long, in the longer run. How do we organize research? Again, from my experience in Russia, their system with the Russian Academy of Science, which has main responsibility for research, and the universities, which have main responsibility for teaching, doesn't work very well. 
it's a bad idea. The Chinese and the Vietnamese and others who've been, uh, I'm sure the Cubans, who've had the influence of the Soviet model have that system. And the Russians now realize that it needs to change and they're trying. The challenge of private higher education and privatization, because increasingly, and this is absolutely the case in the US, public institutions are being privatized. We are asking them to pay for more of their own budgets. And that has lots of problems. Of course, the main one, increased tuition for the students, but also availability of funding in general. The challenge of accountability. Universities, yes, funded by government, measured for their, for their quality, need to be accountable. But they also need to be autonomous. There needs to be a balance somehow. The challenge of both access and competition. How competitive should universities be with each other within a country? How competitive should they be for trying to attract good students and so on? The challenge of funding, which I could go on for days and requires deep thought because funding of higher education is deep, is problematical in much of the world. How does tuition payment fit into that pattern? The challenge of the academic profession, we'll be talking about that tomorrow, so I won't mention it here, but if you're going to have top universities, you have to have top faculty. The faculty are the core of any academic institution. Finally, the challenge of technology was mentioned before. We have, we have heard now for a quarter of a century that we are on the verge of the technological revolution in higher education. A decade or so ago, it was the MOOCs who were going to take over. They didn't. We now talk about artificial intelligence and other aspects. And I think that maybe now we really are at the base of the te technological revolution. So the challenge of technology, which has become much more effective and significant uh, in very recent years, is still just over the horizon. But I think we're about there. So we need to think deeply about how to use it and how to understand it. You may notice where I am with this technology. I did not use even a PowerPoint. So I'm really back in Gutenberg's time. <laughs> I understand books, but maybe not so much after that. Um, so we need to deal with technology. Will it totally change universities around the world? I don't think so. I think especially the top universities around the world are still going to value face-to-face, -face, are still going to value the kinds of seminars and even lectures, although that's becoming a little bit obsolete, that most of us in this room grew up with. That the meeting of minds, not over a computer, but in a room, in a, on a campus, in a face-to-face -face environment, is important, will be important, both for the intellectual communication and for the networking and building of relationships that goes on, especially in the top universities. So to conclude, we are in a period of great change that, to be honest, relatively few of us anywhere and maybe dramatically in the Dominican Republic, are really dealing with in the serious way that it needs to be dealt with. So my main message is 
understand it and get serious. Thank you.